Alinda Jarofsky, and I'm in the Anthropology Sociology Program in the Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences College, our new college. And I am pleased to introduce Renee Romanos. I've known her a long time. That's what we decided, right? We've known each other a long time. <laughs> and as she pointed out, I'm the elder. She's not yet by a few months. But uh, Renee uh, graduated from EOU uh, after a second try here uh, in the Ant Social Program with the anth Anthropology Concentration. Did phenomenal work on food and hunger with me uh, in our local community at a time when our community was in great need, it still is, and, uh, and made so many uh, uh, differences to our community. Uh, she was involved with Spelia, the Native American club, its oldest club at EOU, the also the oldest uh, Native American club in the nation and has a long heritage uh, that we relish in. Um, I'm the advisor. We have a number of Spilia members here in case you're interested in getting involved. And so Renee uh, got her bachelor's here and then went on to Oregon State University and got her master's and has continued speaking, um, has done activism in terms of environmental rights, people's rights um, for justice and many other things, and as an artist, I think she's finally embraced being an artist, right? Um, but I've, uh, the entire time I've known her, she has been one. Um, and she didn't know. And uh, so I welcome her here. I'm glad that you're here to uh, listen to her, uh, share her poetry with you. Thank you. Okay, ta-da! So I recruited Dr. Jarofsky to do to go Facebook Live. So this entire performance and our time together will be um, on my feed. Renee L. Roman knows, and I, I can't add any more people because I I topped out at 5K because I travel all the time, and well not all the time, but quite frequently speaking to groups all over the United States. I do a lot of wellness in the workplace, team building, and I do a lot of work with youth. I was just speaking at um, Hendrick Hudson High School in the Catskills. Can anyone raise their hand if they know of the Catskills, know where it's at? Thank you, one person, two people. The Catskills are absolutely lovely, and I had never been there before, and the road's really narrow, so when you go, let someone else drive. So I started writing when I was in sixth grade, wrote my first poem. And my sister, it was one of those things where the older people here, the mature people here might remember this art form from when we were kids where you had a piece of cardboard and then you wrote something on it and you put leaves on it and then you ironed wax paper over it. Thank you, yes. And that still hangs in my sister's house today. I was like, um, hello. Not in sixth grade anymore. Can you take that down? She's like, that's my poem. I'm like, I know. But put it in the closet or something. <laughs> so I, I don't think we ever really appreciate our own art, our own abilities to create art in whatever form we find. And I'm very fortunate that I have been able to refocus my life on art and on my writing. And my book got published in Ju July by Uttered Chaos Press. And how awesome of a name is that for a publisher? And Uttered Chaos Press is out of Eugene. The uh, book launch will officially be December 16th. So this is like pre-book launch. The artwork on the front, I did myself. It's two needle beading. It was the first time I ever did two needle beading. And for those of you who are familiar with beadwork, this type of beadwork, you would lay down a picture first, and then you would put the beads over top of it. Well, what I wanted was not what I was finding in pictures, so I tore all the paper off and I did this from my heart. 
and it's actually about this big. And it sits on the back of my denim jacket, which I don't even wear because it's too big. <laughs> and it's not warm enough for upstate New York. So all that said, I am really pleased that you chose to spend some time with me this evening. And I hope that you'll enjoy yourself, you'll enjoy the poetry, and feel free to clap if you like it, and don't clap if you don't like it. It's OK. Any basketball players here? One. Yeah, one, two, three, four, yeah. So the first poem, this is one of my really, I love this poem. On the Lummi Reservation, there's an abandoned house, and in the driveway, there's an old basketball hoop. And somebody has spray painted the words war hoop on the pole as a play on words. Like war hoop would be woo hoo, right? Uh, totally different spelling. So war hoop. Passing left, faking right, playing ball all through the night, sweat pouring down my face, competing hard for first place, bragging rights for years to come, carve on my headstone when I'm done. Res ball champion, that's what it'll say when the sun sets on my final day. Put a ball in my hand and sing me on my way. Thank you. Yay! That was delayed entry clapping. I understand it because I also do stand-up comedy. I'm like, oh, they didn't get that joke. <laughs> that's so painful. So my first book has... Um, a lot of topics from historical to contemporary Native issues. And some of it's not tough hitting, uh, but a lot of it is. Because when I read things, I can't keep that pain inside me. I have to put it down on paper. And that's where my poetry comes from. When I literally have hundreds of poems. And after this book got to the point where it was going to be published, I thought, you know, I really need to start writing comedic poetry. I need to write stuff that's a little bit lighter uh, to ease my own heart. And so that's what I uh, started doing. And so I'll be sharing some of that with you guys also. From my uh, second book to become, this is the working title, Have War Paint, Will Travel. And it's been a lot of fun writing this one. And it's been uh, cathartic as well. This poem is called Vows. I'll take care of you, he promised so long ago. I'll love, honor, cherish, and respect you. He promised, though drunk at the time, to let no man put asunder. He forgot to mention no woman. I'll take care of you, he promised so long ago, before seeking the advice of an attorney and taking the house, taking the furniture, the car, the cat, Hope he takes better care of the cat. It's funny now. It's 20 years ago. It's OK. <laughs> Best thing I ever did for myself. <laughs> you know, when you're young, um, you don't always make the best choices. So when you're looking for a partner, find somebody who thinks of you first, not second. Find somebody who cares about your well-being more than their own. Because you deserve that. You deserve love. And I think if we were all more deliberate in our choices, that we would find what we really want and what we truly deserve. And divorce attorneys would just have to go away. So have war paint. We'll travel. I've got my war paint, don't you know? It's in my purse wherever I go. It's on my lips on a Saturday night to make them look oh so bright. To catch your eye, play tricks with your heart to make you stumble from the start. A little shadow, a bit of blush, a little color, but not too much. Make my eyes sparkle, make my lips shine, make you wish that you were mine. <laughs> Thank you. So the reason this horse is on the front of my book is because I went through my vision quest and this is not obviously not exactly what I saw. I didn't see a horse made of beads, <laughs> but I saw a horse. I was um, with someone else going through this, through this event, someone who eventually became my sister um, through ceremony. My grandfather held the ceremony, 
and uh, took this person as my sister. So I call her Stumpy. <laughs> <laughs> she keeps trying to flip me off, but I can't really tell. <laughs> anyway, what I saw and what helped me get through my vision quest, because I became very ill, and I didn't know, but I was diabetic. You're not supposed to go without food and water for four days and three nights if you're diabetic. But I did anyway. My strength. I see the stallion, thundering hooves striking, powerfully driving him, muscles bunch and respond, conquering the steep mountain with ease. He storms past me, his strength flowing into me, renewing me physically, spiritually. The stallion gallops determinedly, thundering up the mountain in my mind, protecting me, strengthening me. The storms that surround me fall before him, thundering hooves scattering the inconsequential, the fear and doubt. I feel the stallion in my heart, enveloping my soul, encompassing me, his high blinding in its purity. The storms which once ravaged my heart and my life, devastating all in their path, now swept aside by a greater purpose. Thank you. I wrote this one for my son. I have two children from my marriage, my son Wokawokamash and my daughter Stephanie. And then I have four girls who needed a mom and I just happened to be there at the right time. So they all call me mom and I adopted them, Cheyenne Way. So I ha actually have six children. Native son, you brighten my life with your smile, your heart as warm as the sun. Each day you struggle with harassment at school for your long hair, for your native heritage. I listen to your words of frustration and shed my tears inside. While my words chosen with care encourage you to be strong. I try to balance my anger with reason and kindness while wondering why the kids at your school aren't taught the same by their parents. I see you growing, changing. Last year you were shorter than me. This year you tower over me, calling me little. You make me laugh with your jokes, your teasing ways, so sweet and gentle, all big heart, feet, and awkward bones, growing every day in more than height. Thank you. Could somebody bring me water? <coughs> Pardon me. My, my son wanted to play football for Crescent Valley High School, and they told him he couldn't play football unless he cut his hair. I don't know how many of y'all ever watch football. Thank you. Professional football? Those guys never cut their hair. So I said to him, I said, well, son, it's your hair. What do you want to do? And he said, I think I'm going to go out for soccer. <laughs> So we went out for soccer, and my son is a lot like me. We both are high-energy individuals. He would literally run around whoever he was supposed to be guarding in circles until he wore them out. <laughs> and other kids would go, no, don't chase him, no. <laughs> He's just going to wear you out. And he would. He was so funny. Too Indian. He said that I was too Indian when he said goodbye. And I watched him walk away with tears in my eyes. I let him go because I knew that he was right. The bridge between our races could not be spanned by me alone. He needed to meet me in the middle by building from his side. The bridge remains unfinished except for the long span from my side. I worked on it for so long. Thank you. So this one, uh, called expression. Don't you see that you are living on stolen land, that the immigration bill you support wholeheartedly would have applied to the first boat people on the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria? Can you not feel the injustice of a nation that offered citizenship to its first citizens in 1924? This same nation that despised those native men who declined to fight in World War I, for a country that denied them their language, their fertility, their culture, their children, their land, their religion, 
only to grant them citizenship in 1924, a country that had hunted us to virtual extinction only 40 years before. Indian Wars, Seminole Wars, Sand Creek, Little Bighorn, Battle of the Washita, Trail of Tears, Wounded Knee, the Black Hills, native land buried under miles and miles of concrete. Thank you. So I read this one today. I was invited to speak to the faculty. There was a faculty meeting. Um, actually, Dr. Jarofsky um, was invited to speak, and she was going to. She was asked to read a poem, and instead she brought the poet. <laughs> and she was uh, joking about I win on uh, what's it called? What did you say? Show and tell. Show and tell. Yes. <laughs> She said, I went on show and tell. So that was pretty hilarious. So I read this poem, Wind Song. The wind carries messages for those with ears to hear. The trees carry signs for those with eyes to see. The forest tells stories to those who can read. The eagle beckons to those whose spirits are free. Thank you. Okay, I'm having a hot flash. All you young girls, this is what you have to look forward to. So we were, my husband and I, uh, we went to Standing Rock on our honeymoon. And uh, for those of you who know are familiar with Standing Rock, that's where we spent our honeymoon. And yeah, the people there laughed at us too. Why are you here? <laughs> you know, you, don't even, you didn't even bring a teepee with you. Come on. <laughs> so anyways, we... Um, we spent time there and, and we learned a lot about ourselves and about our people, all of our people, because people came from all over the world to stand shoulder to shoulder at Standing Rock to protect water. So I encourage each of you to find your passion, find what's important to you, and protect something other than yourself. I promise you it will not diminish your lives, on the contrary, it will greatly improve them. This poem is from my grandfather, who um, guided me through Bear Butte, my vision quest, my four years there, and in many ways in my life. And he continues to resonate in my life, and he's been gone <clears throat> too long already. Dignity. He walks into the arena with care. Each step causes his body pain. Yet his mind rejoices. Rejects the stresses, trembling legs that threaten to fail and do not. His back slightly bowed by time, a face deeply carved by life, by love, loss, survival. His will stronger than flesh, his heart and soul in each step. Carries him with grace, slow, painful. His movements reflect the beauty and strength of the drum. Enduring, everlasting, inspiring. Thank you. So my, thank you. My num shim, my grandfather, called me when I was in grad school, and he said, granddaughter, do you have a passport? I'm like, no. And he said, can you get one? Yes. Good. You could come to Europe with me. Get your passport. I said, OK. So I got my passport, which is really tough when you're in grad school because they're not cheap. <laughs> and I didn't think anything of this. I thought, well, you know, I'm going to humor my grandfather. So he called me again. He uh, said, granddaughter, did you get your passport? I said, yeah. Good. We leave Monday. <laughs> I'm like, ah, I'm in grad school. <laughs> so um, I went to ran around all my professors, and I said, um, I got to go to Europe with my grandpa. Can I have my assignments ahead of time? Can I email you? I don't know if my laptop will work over there, but let's try this. So I did. I went to Europe with my grandfather. First time I'd ever been to Europe. And everywhere we went, people were drawn to him. He was a very striking man, and he had such a dignity to him. So if you've ever, how many people have seen Last of the Dogmen? So the old chief who only speaks Cheyenne, that's my grandpa. And we called him Grandpa Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
And he was just an amazing person. And we ended up in Switzerland and went to the Swiss Alps. I'm moving that out of my way. Went to the Swiss Alps with my grandfather. And we're up in the top where there's, um, I think it's called the Matterhorn. And there's a band playing. And they're in Lederhosen. So I turned to my grandfather and I, I asked him, I said, Nam Shim, do you want to get your picture with the natives? <laughs> and so he's holding his little cane and he just, his shoulders start shaking and he goes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we had so many adventures together and, and I, have, I have those pictures where we sat in front and we got permission to get our picture with the band in Lederhosen. And they're all behind him. And, and if you know that story, then you, you understand the grin on his face. He was quite the character and uh, with an amazing sense of humor. So this poem was written for Rose Olney. Um, she is a Yakima woman. And it was written probably 20 years ago. She was very kind to me. I worked in Indian gaming as a sale, national sales rep. And every time I saw her, she always had a warm smile and kind words to say. I never heard her say an unkind word about anyone or anything. And I just think that's so inspiring. I just aspire for that <laughs> for myself. <sighs> I'm getting better, though. Native Bloom, rose by name, rose by heart. You can feel that come through from the start. With beauty unchecked by time, she is dignity and honor clearly defined. Dancing with honor, moving with style and grace, the pride of her people shone on her face. Rose, she is a native rose, rose is her name. She's a native woman, too strong to tame. Thank you. <laughs> Racism. I am standing in line at Kmart, waiting like the good girl I've been brought up to be. Waiting in line at Kmart for my turn to be helped by the clerk. Watching one white person after another be helped and sent on their way while I wait and wait and see more white people step up before me. Confused and frustrated, I finally ask to be waited on. While the white people around me look on with frank disapproval. I am embarrassed at their judgment, at my own forwardness, and then angry that this is how it is. That's a true story. I was in Kmart in Oklahoma City. I needed to have a key made. And for some reason, everybody in the state needed a key that day. And I swear to you, there, there, there was a crowd of people. Everybody needed a key. And it was just so embarrassing to have to push myself forward and say, you know, it's my turn, and I got somewhere to be too. This isn't to say that everybody, every white person is like that. Thank God they're not. But it's something we all have to speak up and speak out against, especially in these difficult times. We have to stand together, shoulder to shoulder, all ethnicities, whether you're a basketball player or a soccer player. We need to stand together against injustice. We need to stand together and raise our voices so someday someone else's son can play football without cutting his hair. I don't see a clock. And you know, you, you give a poet a microphone and no clock. I hope you all brought pajamas. OK. Winter. Oh, I got to tell you all, I, do not, I, I cannot connect with poetry that doesn't make sense to me, that doesn't have a message. How many of you all feel the same way? Oh, thank heavens. <laughs> so I, this is the only poem I have that has an underlying meaning. Like when I was in English, uh, I remember reading a poem that was about a young man who was um, going out to the woods with his dad. And they were going to cut down a tree, bring home some firewood. And I was like, oh, that's a cool poem, because I grew up by Mount Hood. And we cut firewood all the time, all year round, because it had the season, right? Only the professor said, it's not about cutting wood. I'm like, well, is it about bonding between a father and a son? No. 
It's about suicide. I'm like, did we read the same poem? <laughs> I was like, yeah, you can hear the snow crunching. Yeah, that's cool. He's with his dad. I didn't get that at all. I, to, to this day, I still don't get that. But winter, crisp snow underfoot, icy wind curling around my bones, sending tendrils of chill around my skin, sneaking through the warm wool coat, the extra layers of cotton, the thick warm socks worn to protect me from the wind. Sneaky wind so clever and fast, finding the seams, the minute little spots that open in welcome and invite the wind in and leave me to shiver and curse the mad wind. What's that about? It's got nothing to do with being cold. <laughs> and it's the only poem I have that's like that. It's about verbal abuse. No matter how many layers you put on, those unkind words are still going to hurt. Whether it's from a parent, step-parent, um, co-worker, teammate, I met a girl today that she was standing in line at financial aid and she was receiving financial support from her tribe, from her nation. The kid behind her called her a wagon burner because she has a scholarship. And that still hurt her today when she told me that story. That hurt me for her. We don't need to be that way. We can be kind to each other. We can uplift one another, and we should. We definitely should. OK, anybody here have a psycho ex? Anybody? One honest person. One. All y'all laughing? Yes, I know. You might as well just raise your hand. Everybody out here knows. I see you in the back with your blue hat. He's like, can't see me, but yeah. <laughs> We only tease people we like. That's a big part of our culture. If we don't tease you, you might want to worry. <laughs> so, psycho exes. We met in a chat room, shared late nights and several LOLs. It seemed too good to be true when he invited me to meet. Coffee or breakfast, your town or mine. Our first meeting, so short and sweet, led to another and another. Soon, we were sharing more than laughs, more than a chat room. His res nearby mine, his friends and family were cool. Mine liked him too. But then she came back. Godzilla with PMS and a resitude, fully loaded, head tilting, loud, rapid fire words, destroying the peacefulness we'd shared, wanting her damn man back, demanding that he come home with her. And he did. Looking back at me shamefacedly as she pulled him along behind her, as if I would rescue my weak ass warrior from his own demise. <laughs> fry bread her butt, if it would have fit in the fryer, I would have. She can have him, that weak warrior, not man enough for me, can't dance traditional, can't speak his language, can't sing 49 songs to me, can't drum, can't even play the love flute. All he had going for him was long hair, a great smile with his own teeth. <laughs> and what I thought was a genuine love for me. Watching him be dragged into the distance, I breathed a sigh of relief. Now she would have to support his non-working butt, put up with his complaining about everything, none of which he paid for. But damn, he was a good kisser. Thank you. You know those little tabby things where you go, oh, I need to mark this page. I didn't bring any of those with me. <laughs> I was like, where'd that go? <laughs> That's so helpful. <laughs> give, give, give. Thank you. Innocence. Colored, said the pastor so long ago. What color, the little boy asked, loudly during church services, catching one word in the sermon. Were they pink, the boy asked curiously. Were they green? His confusion, a mirror of my own. 
my embarrassment highlighting me. Laughter filled the church. Awareness crept in and light. He is right, said the pastor. What does it matter what color? Thank you. So that story, that's based on a true story. One of my friends is a Potawatomi elder, and he said that happened to him uh, with his son. I was like, that's awesome. I'm going to make a poem about that. So I will leave you with the following poem. And if you so desire, I have books and CDs that are for sale. The books are 20. The CDs are 10. Yeah, right there. OK, now, <laughs> nobody looks while you're waving. I love that. <laughs> like, there's nobody over there. This is called Eternal Song. It's one of my favorites that I've ever written. I feel the song of a thousand years. I smell the earth of my ancestors. I see the sky that looked on other nations. I hear the song that carries us through the ages. I taste the victory so long denied. Thank you. Any questions? This is like the least questioning campus I have ever been on in my life. I've been to countless, it seems like countless, <laughs> classes and events while I've been here. And I've had maybe three questions. So ask me anything. Yes, thank you. It did. So I took, uh, so this is what happened. I always wanted to be an artist. I always wanted to paint. There's actually a poem about how I wanted to be a painter, but I paint with words and I put a picture in a reader's mind. That's from that poem. And I didn't have the confidence to do that. I didn't know that I had skills in those areas. And in 2010, I was rear-ended by a bus going 60 miles an hour down I-5. And I was in the carpool lane, which had suddenly come to a halt during rush hour traffic. So I saw this bus coming at me, and I realized he wasn't slowing down. And I thought we were going to die. And rightly so. You would think a bus coming at you 60 miles an hour, you're going to die. So I had enough, just enough time to take evasive action. And the bus hit about this much of our six-day-old car and totaled it, glanced off us, hit two more cars, and got pulled off um, just before wild waves, if you all know where that's at. And when I, um, my progress as an injured person, because I jammed every joint in my body, which is why you see me moving, you, the more you move, the more your, your joints um, stay fluid. And so I um, was an athlete. I was competing for Warrior Dash. If any of you all know what that is, it's a cross-country obstacle course. My son, my 17-year-old son at the time, and I were training together. I'm a, a former athlete. I competed in three varsity sports here, and I um, coached. I ran Honolulu Marathon a couple times. I ran dozens of 10Ks, and after the accident, I could barely walk a quarter mile. I could not speak fluently. I'd lost my vocabulary. I couldn't recognize people that I'd known since childhood. I couldn't remember anything. If you asked me to remember numbers, and you said, OK, my phone number is 315, I would go like this with the pen. I'm like, OK, what was that again? I had traumatic brain injury. and took a long time to come back from that. And poetry helped me come back from that. Because I kept exercising my brain. Your brain's a muscle. Keep working it. The more you work it, the better, the less likely you will uh, be to have Alzheimer's when you're older. So after the accident, when I finally could speak again, I realized that I wanted the rest, the second half of my life, assuming that I get another 50 years, right? <laughs> I wanted it to be more about art. So I do poetry workshops all across the country. And I talk to people, hello up there. <laughs> I talk to people all across the country about following your passion. Do what makes you feel good. I now paint. I had an art show up in upstate New York in May. 
and I'm featured artist on the 16th in Everett, Washington. So I'll be showing my photography and running a poetry workshop and giving people editing cues and performance skills. And then we'll have an open mic. So I want to help other people find their art. I want to help other people to be encouraged. The encouragement that I didn't get, I want to give to others because I know it makes such a difference in people's lives. If someone comes to you and said, you're really good at this, you should keep doing it. How often do we hear that? When's the last time one of you got a compliment? Seriously, did you get a compliment today? Raise your hand if you got a compliment today. Excellent, excellent. So the other thing from the accident is that I learned to appreciate others. Like sometimes you'll see somebody walking down the street, like we were sitting at dinner tonight, and all I could think was how beautiful you are. And I want you to know that. I don't, ha I don't have a guarantee for tomorrow. I don't even have a guarantee for five minutes from now. So I want you to know while we're here that I think you're absolutely stunning. You're welcome. You're welcome. Because we're not taught to accept those things, are we? We're like, oh, oh no, I'm not, I'm not good at that. No, yes, you are. So I do glass art. I have a mosaic. The first mosaic um, piece I ever did is of what? What do you might think it might be of? It is. It's a stallion. It's a white stallion. And it's like this wide, and it's this tall, and it sits on our mantle. And it took me two years to make, and it's the first glass piece I ever did. You don't know what your skills are till you try. Take an art class. Take a language class. Take anthropology. Like in our culture, you don't do anything with anthropology. Ooh. <laughs> she knows. But I tell people, I studied anthropology because it's time for us to preserve our own stories, our own songs, and share them with our people or others if we decide we want to. Find what you're passionate about. Is it photography? Is it hunting? If it's hunting, give me your deer hide. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? And thank you for that long explanation of your question. Hi. Um, actually, before the, the class you visited, um, my class, I had gone on, I love Amazon because you can cheat and you can look inside someone's work. And I, so I read a lot of your poems. And you read the one last today, Too Indian, yes. that struck me powerfully. Um, and it's a hard question to ask, but what is it you know, um, that, that we can do as a university, of, as white faculty at the university with a res on the other side, um, how can we not be that coach? How, you know, right, how, what can we do more powerfully that you recall that your professors did for you in the past that helped you mm -hmm. persist and to graduate? I would say you can accept students for just the way they are. And that's, um, especially when you're, you're young, you're just coming out of high school, you don't know who you are. I came, um, the reason that poem is about that, uh, winter is about um, verbal abuse is because I had a, an abusive stepfather. He was alcoholic, he was very violent. And his words still hurt me. You'll never amount to anything. You'll never be anyone. You'll never go anywhere. Tell your students that they can go anywhere they want. They can be anything they want. We can do anything we want. The only thing holding you back is yourself. It took me 20 years to publish that book. Maybe a few more than that. 20 years. That's a long time to hold on to a dream. And there's no reason not to hold on to your dreams. I, don't, I tell people, don't pursue your dreams. Don't, don't follow your dreams. Pursue them. Go after them. Pull them into you one by one. Make them happen. No one's going to make your dream happen for you. Because they don't know what your dreams are, right? Only you know. You know only you know you want to go back to Ireland. I want to go with you. <laughs> I'm going to need an interpreter. <laughs>
So I would say accept students for who they are, where they come from. Understand if you have a native student and they don't look you in the eye. It's disrespectful for us to look our elders in the eye. I've learned to do it because that's mainstream culture. We have to connect visually with each other, right? And so I've learned to overcome that. But if, if I'm at home or if I'm in another tribal community, I will look at that person's shoulder. I will look at their ear. I will not make direct eye contact because that's considered a challenge. And it's very disrespectful. Understand the culture of the people you're dealing with and you're trying to help. And encourage them. What are you studying? Why are you studying it? What do you want to do? What do you want to do with your degree? I'll tell you straight out that most of the people I know my age who have college degrees don't even work in those fields. <laughs> One guy has an early childhood education and he works in IT. He, he uh, taught for like one year and went, no, that's not for me. But find your passion. And don't be afraid to reinvent yourself. I've reinvented myself several times, especially since the car accident. But follow your dreams, whatever those are. Find your passion. Find how you can make a difference in your world, even if it's something small. Maybe you're just donating to the local food bank. But just donating is huge. Providing food for other people is huge. Maybe you're fighting for better food in the schools for students. That's gigantic. I ate lunch with Hendrick Hudson High School on Friday and in the Catskills, I think I mentioned that. And I walked around at lunchtime and I shook hands with all the students at lunch. And I would say 90% of them were having French fries. How much nutrition is in French fries? These are when your bodies are growing the most. I even said to one kid, there's no color on your plate. It's all tan. All your food is tan. <laughs> Where is it? Where's something that's going to you know, stick with you past the third period? <laughs> so, so just be accepting. And I know a lot of kids will come into EOU and they'll be shy. I was really shy. I, my first work study job was in this library downstairs. I made copies on a mimeograph. <laughs> and uh, I did things like that. And the woman who was my supervisor, Mary Heinemann, I stayed at her house on Sunday night. We're still friends to this day. Keep the people around you who you love and who love you. Don't let them go. Even if time passes by and you're like, oh, I really need to call that person. Pick up the phone and call that person. I guarantee you they still care. So thank you. Anything else? Um, as a minority, it's really easy to feel like you don't have a space, I guess. And I guess I was just wondering, when is it that you embraced your culture and really put it into your art without feeling like it was going to be um, rejected, I guess, by people? So for me, I didn't care if it was rejected. Um, that poem, that was about my ex-husband, two Indians. That was my ex-husband. In fact, there's another poem in my book that talks about um, why I'm writing about Native issues. And uh, I know we're running out of time, so I won't read it to you. But you can buy my book and read it yourself. <laughs> um, the important thing is do what makes you happy. You get one life. I've been telling students all week long, I've got right here, right now, to be real with you. There are plenty of people in the world who are going to blow smoke at you, tell you what they think you want to hear. No, you don't need that. You need to know what's real. You need professors who will tell you exactly what classes you need to take and when to get your assignments in, and don't slag. Uh, speaking of Linda, <laughs> could you, this gentleman had a question. <laughs> I ask like really basic and simple questions. Um, do you have a favorite athlete of any sort right now or anything like that? Colin Kaepernick. Oh, yeah. 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 The courage and strength shown by, I want to be his mom. Yeah. I love him that much. What courage that took. And he's still fighting for a job. And he's an amazing athlete. 
you know, just just amazing. That's a great question. Thank you. And so the reason, uh, well, Richard Sherman, <laughs> ditto, Marshawn Lynch. <laughs> so I think for Christmas I'm getting a Marshawn Lynch jersey because <laughs> my daughter asked me, Mom, what do you want for Christmas? Well, you know. She's like, really, Mom? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, really? She says, okay. I'm like, I don't want the Raiders one. I want the Seahawks one. <laughs> yes. Anyone else? Which similar? I can talk loud. I don't need no. mic. Oh, for the video, I think. Sorry. That's okay. All right, there we go. <laughs> um, his question made me think of it, but do you have a favorite author or other poets who have inspired you? Maya Angelou. She's my favorite poet of all time. Still I Rise. Still I Rise, my favorite poem of all time. I've been reading poetry. H.P. Lovecraft. <laughs> I was a really quirky kid. I taught myself to read. And when I was a kid, because um, I'm so old, we didn't have kindergarten. I'm not kidding you. <laughs> so there's no kindergarten. So I taught myself to read before first grade. I was reading at college level by fourth grade. Yeah, and I didn't know other people couldn't do that. I thought everybody read like that. So I read all kinds. Yeah, you don't know, right? If you're a great painter, you think everybody can paint. This is easy for me. It should be easy for everybody. My both, uh, two of my kids, um, their dad is dyslexic. They're dyslexic. So when they were growing up, I couldn't understand. How can you not read? Here, this, this, that's what this word is. They couldn't see it, that's why. They couldn't see it. So I had to learn to be more patient and kind and understanding. So I hope that answers your question. I kind of went off on a tangent. Anybody else? Well, I would like to thank you for your time, for coming out spending the evening with me and for inviting me to your campus. It means the world to me to be back here on my old stomping grounds and in the library where I had my first work study job. Stay in school, don't drop out. <laughs> it took me 20 years to go, oh, I'm tired of dead end jobs. I should go back to college. <laughs> so if you get a bachelor's degree, it's equal to, equivalent to um, a $1 million winning lottery ticket over the course of your lifetime. Would you tear that up and throw it away? No. Stay in school. Go on and get a master's if you can. Do it now while you're long, young, no kids, no responsibilities other than yourself. Do it now. Even if you do have kids, do it now. <laughs> I'm all bossy. Bring me back in a couple years and I'll scold you again. Well, thank you. No, oh, thank you. Absolutely. And here's a gift. Oh. Thank you. Yay. Oh, how beautiful. Aren't those pretty? So I'd like to ask the librarian if she could come up. And uh, somebody to have a pen. Oh, thank you. That's awesome. You're, you guys already gave me a gift. Wow. Does anyone have a pen that I might borrow? Oh, look how beautiful that is. It says EOU. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Spelia. So this is... This is really emotional for me. Um, so I want you guys to have a copy of my book. And I love saying this, my book. <laughs> so this will be for each of you to come read it when you want. And uh, I'd like to present it to your librarian. Yay! <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah. And I, I decided to do it when I saw new books. I'm like, hey, my book would look great right there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, all of you. I hope to see you at, at Spilia on Friday, um, speaking to Dr. Jarofsky's class tomorrow morning at too dark early. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, she's speaking to my archaeology class in Badgley 119 at 830. If you want to show up and hear her presentation, you're welcome. And then uh, doing a talking circle at 
2 p.m. in the library on the third floor, and you're all welcome to come too. Yeah. So. Everyone's welcome. You don't have to be native to be there. Yeah. You just have to come with an open heart and an open mind. And let's put our minds together, as um, Sitting Bull once said, and see what, what kind of world we can create for our children. Thank you.